Next, we're going to move on to infinite slope analysis. So, first, let's talk about what an infinite slope is, because as the name infinite implies, it's actually physically impossible to have an infinite slope. But um, if, if a slope has a very shallow failure surface, like this one drawn here in green, it can be approximated as an infinite slope by looking at a free body diagram kind of in the middle of the slope, because what's happening on the left and the right sides are basically the same. We're far enough away from these boundaries that you can analyze the slope in the middle. Technically, the slope would have to extend infinitely uphill and downhill in order to truly have an infinite slope. So that doesn't really happen, but as long as the depth to the failure plane is small enough, we can approximate it as an infinite slope. So this one's approximately an infinite slope. This one's not even close, right? You can see these uh, corners are definitely like part of the failure surface here. We would never use an infinite slope analysis to analyze that kind of free body diagram <coughs> because what's happening on the left and the right sides are totally different. So um, let's, let's look at uh, how we do infinite slope analysis. We can analyze a single free body diagram and solve for the factor of safety pretty easily um, for an infinite slope. And here's that free body diagram right here. <coughs> Okay, what we end up with is here's the ground surface. Let's assume that there's no water. We'll, we'll talk about water pressure when we get to number two after doing a dry slope. So the forces acting on this infinite slope are the weight of the slope, W. Uh, there's a normal force, capital N, that's acting perpendicular to the bottom of the slope. And then there's a shear force, capital T, that's acting parallel to the bottom of the slope. <coughs> okay, now there are other forces. There's a normal force on the right side and a normal force on the left side, and then there are potentially shear forces on the right and left sides as well. Um, I'm going to invoke a symmetry argument now. So by symmetry, uh, first, the left side force, EL, has to be equal to the right side force, ER. They're equal and opposite. And the reason is that if the slope is infinite, goes infinitely this way and infinitely that way, those forces have to be equal and opposite to each other. Otherwise, they would be growing as you moved uphill or shrinking as you moved uphill and maybe eventually become negative or something like that. So the symmetry argument is a little bit intuitive, but just by symmetry, the left and right forces have to be equal and opposite. They're also collinear, so they don't create a moment, and they just cancel each other out. So we can ignore them in our free body diagram. Uh, similarly, the tau r has to be equal and opposite to the tau l by symmetry. And the only way that that's possible is if they're both equal to zero. They, they, they can't be equal and opposite unless they're um, both equal to zero. So there's no shear stresses acting on those faces either. Therefore, we only have these three forces that we have to worry about in our equilibrium equations, at least for a dry slope. We're assuming that there's no forces acting on the surface of the slope which when you have a submerged slope, there actually are. So let's go now to do the dry slope calculation. <clears throat> let's assume that the depth to the failure plane is Z. Depth is measured vertically. Okay, it's not measured perpendicular to the slope. If you were to go to a site that was sloping and drill down, you would drill vertically, and then you'd measure depth vertically down. So Z is depth to the failures, to the sliding surface. And then this lowercase l, or scripted l, is the length of the slope measured this time parallel to the surface of the slope. All right, so basically the vertical components of all of these force vectors have to add up to zero, and the horizontal components have to add up to zero, too. So we can represent force equilibrium by drawing the vectors head to tail in a force polygon, and because of equilibrium, those forces have to close, right? The polygon has to close. So here we have W acting vertically, then there's T, the shear force acting the, the direction parallel to the slope, and then N is perpendicular to the slope, and the slope angle is beta. So we get that T is equal to W times sine beta, and N is equal to W times cosine beta. Very simple trigonometry here. And then W is equal to gamma LZ cosine beta. And let me just explain how I got that. You have gamma, which is the unit weight of the soil material, and then you want to find the area, right? So the area is L times whatever that side length is. Well, since we measured Z vertically, that side length is equal to Z cosine beta. So that's where that Z cos beta comes in. Um, okay, so what we can do now, we've got all this. Let's move over here and do shear and normal 
stress is. So the shear stress is equal to big T divided by the length, so divided by lowercase l. And fortunately, these lowercase l's cancel out. Um, <coughs> since we have an infinite slope that goes infinitely up and downhill, it doesn't matter how long the free body diagram is that we take, we're going to get the same solution. So it's good that those things cancel, and we get the tau value that's equal to gamma z cosine beta sine beta. All right, and then sigma is the normal stress. It's equal to the normal force divided by length. And um, the normal force is W cosine beta, and then you multiply gamma LZ cos beta, and you get a cosine squared term. So N is gamma LZ cosine squared beta, and then the L's cancel. So the normal stress is just gamma Z times cosine squared beta. All right, now what we can do is define our shear strength. And we'll assume that we have a more Coulomb failure envelope. And um, there's no water pressure. So in this case, total stresses are equal to effective stresses. Um, any of the more Coulomb failure envelopes that I sketch, you could replace sigma prime, C prime, and phi prime with sigma C and phi and do a total stress analysis, and that would be fine as well. In this case of a dry slope, total and effective stresses are the same, so we don't have to worry about that. So here I'm using the effective stress formulation. C prime is equal to sigma prime tangent of phi prime. And all we have to do is substitute in our expression for sigma prime, which is the same as the expression for sigma. And you get C prime plus gamma z cosine squared beta tangent of phi prime. Okay, now we can define our factor of safety. It's equal to the shear strength divided by the equilibrium shear stress. So you get C prime plus gamma z cos squared beta tangent of phi prime divided by gamma z cosine beta sine beta. And then there is a, a special case um, when c is equal to zero, um, the gamma z terms cancel as well. And then you can simplify, you know, one of these cosine beta terms cancels and you get cosine beta over sine beta, which is just equal to one over tangent beta. So the factor of safety is equal to tangent of phi prime divided by tangent of beta, right? It's really easy. It's the, tangent of the friction angle divided by the tangent of the slope angle. And that's the factor of safety for a cohesionless infinite slope. Now, <clears throat> let's make it a little more complicated. And let's say that we have a submerged slope, but with hydrostatic water pressure. Okay, the hydrostatic water pressure actually kind of ruins the symmetry of our problem, which makes it a little bit complicated. It's actually more complicated to solve this problem than one that has seepage that flows out of the slope and runs off thereby creating symmetry. But let's go through it because I think it's a worthwhile exercise to do. So we're talking about having a water table at some height, and I'm measuring that height above the center of the slice, and we'll call it Z sub W. So there's a force now acting on the top of this slope. The water pressure creates a vertical force, and that's equal to gamma W Z W times um, L. Uh, that's the the, the force is equal, this is the pressure, and then you have to multiply by the length of the slice to get a force. Um, okay, now you also have a force acting on the left side of the slope and a force acting on the right side of the slope from the water. If you took the water away, those two forces would have to be equal and opposite because we have symmetry. But because the water table ruins that symmetry, right, this is a horizontal surface, this is an inclined surface, the problem is no longer symmetric as you move along. Uh, FR and FL are different. So let's come over here and solve for those um, parameters. Um, it's, it's simple geometry. Here's the depth of the, to the water table. Then what we need to do is figure out what is the water pressure on the midpoint on the right side and the midpoint on the left side, and then you simply multiply by that side length to get the force. So that pressure right there is equal to the, the unit weight of water times the this depth ZW. Then you have to subtract L over 2 sine beta, which is that little red length right there. Maybe I'll zoom in a bit so you can see it. Uh, and then add back in Z over 2 cosine squared beta, which is this little vertical length right there, right? So the way that I got that, you know, if you got this length all the way up to the surface, that's Z over 2 right there. This is z over 2 cosine beta, and then you do one more time at z over 2 cosine squared beta. Okay, so then um, 
FR is ZW minus L over 2 sine beta, because you have to go up that distance, then you have to go back down the blue distance, which is Z over 2 cosine squared beta, and then you multiply that by gamma W to get the pressure, and then this side length is Z cosine beta. So we've done kind of a lot of calculations now just to get FR. Then on the FL side, um, we have the same thing except the L over 2 sine beta and the Z over 2 cosine beta terms add together rather than one subtracting from the other so that you have all positive signs in here. Now what we can do is subtract these two from each other because the resultant is really what we're interested in for force equilibrium. So FL minus FR simplifies pretty nicely. You just end up with gamma W Z L cosine beta sine beta. Right? So there is an imbalanced force because you have higher water pressure on the left side than on the right side. And that's going to tend to um, push the soil, the soil block from left to right. And of course, the weight of the soil block tends to push it from right to left, so they counterbalance each other. So we end up with this force polygon. Let me write that in here. No force. Polygon. Uh, basically, similar to what we had before, but we do have these two extra forces in there now. Um, we've got the force here that's the one acting on the top of the element. And then we have the um, FL minus FR, which is parallel to T in this case. So that's this force over here that we just solved for. <laughs> and then what we have is N minus gamma W Z W L. So this force and N are in the same direction. And that's equal to W cosine beta. And then you have T plus FL minus FR is equal to W times sine beta. And now we can solve for tau. It's simply just T, big T over L. And um, you get this equation over here. I'll skip over saying some of the steps. You can look at the notes and verify the algebra. And you get basically the same thing that we had before for tau, except we have the buoyant unit weight plugged in here instead of the total unit weight. I mentioned before that a trick people use when solving problems with hydrostatic water table is just to substitute the buoyant unit weight. And this is, this is why it works, right? That, that we've solved the equation in a fundamental way and found that gamma minus gamma W actually is the right term to put in here and then multiply Z cosine beta sine beta. So um, I don't like using buoyant unit weight because it's easy to forget that it doesn't work for seepage problems, as we'll show in just a minute. But it does work if the water table is hydrostatic. And you could have just solved this problem by substituting gamma prime for gamma in the previous equation that we derived for a dry slope. OK, and then for sigma, we've got capital N over L. And uh, here's the equation for capital N, and you end up with just um, let's see, gamma W Z W plus gamma Z cosine squared beta, okay? And um, here's the pore pressure now, right? Gamma W times Z cosine squared beta plus Z W. So let me explain how I've gotten that. Um, here, oh, I had it drawn somewhere. I, I lost my sketch. Anyway, what we need is the pore pressure um, right at the bottom of the slice right there now. If you were to just extend this line down, right, that distance is Z. This distance is Z times cosine of beta. And then the vertical distance here from, you know, from this dashed line down to the center point is Z cosine squared beta. So that's how I got this expression for the water at the bottom, the water pressure. Okay, and then you get sigma prime and sigma minus u, and after substituting everything in, you get another expression that involves gamma prime. So you get a gamma minus gamma w there times z cosine squared beta. Again, exactly the same as what we had for the dry slope, with the exception that we've substituted gamma prime for gamma. Then we can do our substitution to find the shear strength here, plug in to get factor of safety, and you'll find that it's exactly the same, except we've got gamma primes here instead of gammas. And then if C prime is equal to zero, 
um, the gammas and z's actually cancel, and you end up with an identical expression to what we had for the dry slope. Factor safety is just tangent e prime divided by tangent of beta. So submerging a slope uh, does not actually change its its factor of safety if c prime is equal to zero. If c prime is, is not zero, it will change the factor of safety a bit. But if c prime is zero, a cohesionless slope, factor of safety is the same whether it's submerged or not. All right, now let's look at another problem that um, does maintain the symmetry, and it involves seepage. So we're not going to be using buoyant unit weights here. We can't do that because now we have seepage, and the seepage is going to be parallel to the slope. So we're assuming that the water table is right at the surface, just for simplicity. Um, and so there's no force acting up on the top of the slope, and we have symmetry again. Right? But when we had the horizontal water table that destroyed symmetry, now this whole thing is symmetric. So the force on the left side is equal to the force on the right side of the block, and we can ignore those forces. And of course, the shear stresses on those sides are also zero. Um, okay, so what we need to do is figure out how much is the pore pressure at the bottom of, the, um, of, the, of our free body diagram here. And the way that we can do that is to use the one-dimensional energy equation, sometimes called the Bernoulli equation. And simply stated, if you have a standpipe piezometer that extends down to the point of interest, the water will rise up to a level that's based on the position of the equipotential lines. Right? There's no head loss along these equipotential lines. So uh, what that means is that the water, the total head at this point is the same as the total head at that point. And that means that the water table would be at that height right there. So here's our flow lines, the blue ones. They're not quite parallel, drawn parallel to the slope, but they're supposed to be. These green ones are equipotential lines, and we just follow this equipotential line up, and we need to solve for that depth now to figure out how high the water table would be at point B. And that depth is drawn right there. It's, it's just simply Z cosine squared beta, right? So Z is this full height. That height is z cosine beta, and that height is z cosine squared beta. So the pore pressure at point B is gamma w z cosine squared beta. Sigma is gamma z cosine beta. Okay, I'm using kind of the same definitions as for the dry slope here, except maybe the total unit weight is different because now the slope is submerged and it's saturated, so it's a little denser, but still, the equation is the same. You might just have to put in a bigger gamma. And then gamma prime is sigma minus u, so you get gamma minus gamma w, which is gamma prime, of course, times z co cosine squared beta. And then um, one thing that we had going for us with the submerged slope with no seepage is that there was an imbalance in pressure on the left and right side that tended to act from left to right, which was holding the slope up. Now that we don't have that anymore because we've gone back to a symmetrical problem with water running off the face of the slope, uh, there is no contribution of the water to shear stress. It doesn't reduce the shear stress anymore. So now you have T is equal to gamma LZ cosine beta sine beta, just like it was before, and tau is equal to T over L, so you get gamma Z cos beta sine beta. And we plug those into our factor of safety definition, and what we find is that now we have a gamma prime on the top, right, that comes from this term right there, from the sigma prime, but a gamma in the bottom. That did not change to a gamma prime simply because there was no imbalance in water pressure on the left and right sides of the slope. So if we plug in C equals zero, we get factor safety is equal to gamma prime over gamma times tangent of phi prime divided by tangent of beta. So this is different now, right? These, these gammas canceled before, now they don't. We have a gamma prime over gamma. For a dense saturated sand, the total unit weight is often about 20 kilonewtons per meter cubed. Um, that means the gamma prime is, is about 10 kilonewtons per meter cubed, right? Because gamma W is 10 kilonewtons per meter cubed. So this ratio is about a half for dense sand. That means that seepage parallel to the slope is, um, is decreasing the factor of safety by a factor of two. Uh, it's not a surprise that flowing water is very often related to slope failures. Uh, it's not always the case. You can get slope failures due to earthquakes or externally applied loads, but the vast majority of slope failures are caused by some change in groundwater condition. And if you have groundwater flowing out through your slope and down across the face,
face of the slope. That's a destabilizing effect. Another way to think about it is that when water flows through a porous material, it induces drag force. So it's like the water is trying to push the soil out, and there's nothing pushing it back in on the left side because the water is just flowing out and going down. So that's why you get this uh, reduced factor of safety. Um, of course, we could do another problem. Let's do a horizontal seepage problem. Uh, now, instead of having the flow lines be parallel to the slope, they're all horizontal. That makes it actually easier to compute the pore pressure at point B because the depth, if you follow this uh, equipotential line, it's just going to go up a height Z, right? We're not going along the slope or perpendicular to the slope anymore. We're going vertical. So the pore pressure at point B is equal to gamma W times Z based on that standpipe. And, and this, again, is based on the Bernoulli equation. I can go through that during discussion if, you, if you'd like to see more about where that comes from. So gamma prime is now uh, gamma z cos squared beta minus gamma w z. And here's the expression for shear strength. And then tau stays the same, right, because we, nothing has changed here. Um, again, you still have symmetry. Um, that might be a little harder to see. Right now, because you have horizontal flow lines, you might be thinking, wow, the symmetry has been destroyed by these horizontal flow lines. It really hasn't, because if you look at the pore pressure at that point, it's identical to the pore pressure at that point, right? So two sides of, you know, at the same depth on, on both sides of the, front of the free body, the pore pressures are the same, so those pressures cancel each other out. We don't have to include them in our analysis. So you get the factor of safety expression here, and, um, it, you know, instead of a gamma WZ cosine squared beta, now you just have a gamma WZ. So having horizontal seepage actually makes it worse. It, it decreases the factor of safety more. And then if C prime is equal to zero, you get this slightly longer expression here, tangent phi prime over tangent beta minus gamma W and gamma times tangent phi prime over cosine beta sine beta. Um, one thing to point out is that there is not a convenient way to use gamma prime once we start getting horizontal seepage. I guess you could substitute like gamma W is equal to gamma minus gamma prime, but you're still going to have to put in gamma and gamma prime. You can't just now go and substitute gamma prime into this problem and somehow get the right answer. So I, I want to drive home that point. Um, you should always use total unit weights, not buoyant units because it's easy to get in trouble and forget that buoyant unit weights don't work once you start having seepage. Um, okay, then in your homework, you're going to do arbitrarily inclined seepage. So seepage might not be horizontal, it might be coming down at an angle like that, or maybe even up like that. It turns out if seepage is going upward, you get an even lower factor of safety. Um, so, you know, the angle at which the seepage exits